Hello, everybody. Just uh, wanted to share with you an initial reading from Martin Heidegger's uh, first uh, installment, the first releasing of his Black Notebooks, Ponderings 2 through 6, Black Notebooks 1931 to 1938. Interesting on the back, uh, the one quote from the New York Review of Books, quote, they will cast a dark shadow, shadow on Heidegger's legacy, right on the back of the book. Very interesting. And if you'd be interested in joining a reading group, I'm trying to get this together. If I can get enough people, it would be something like on the member section, I would ask for a nominal like $5 participation type fee and we can get a group of us to do some close readings of, um, of this and some other books that I have in mind. Maybe uh, the meditations on the Tarot, but, um, but first I wanted to start with kind of Heidegger. Uh, so let me know if, if in the comments, if you'd be interested and maybe I can set something like that up. So we're going to start. This is the first um, installment of the Black Notebooks. On the inside cover, it says, Ponderings okay, begins the much-anticipated English translation of Martin Heidegger's Black Notebooks. In a series of small notebooks with black covers, Heidegger confided sundry personal observations and ideas over the course of 40 years. The five notebooks in this volume were written between 1931 and 1938, and thus chronicles Heidegger's year as rector at the University of Freiburg during the NIZI era. Published in German as volume 94 of the complete works, these challenging and fascinating journal entries shed light on Heidegger's philosophical development regarding his central question of what it means to be, but also his relation to National Socialism and the revolutionary atmosphere of the 1930s in Germany. Readers previously familiar only with excerpts taken out of context may now determine for themselves whether the controversy and censure the black notebooks have received are deserved or not. And we're just going to start at the very beginning. I'm going to read just a, it's going to be a short one. So I just wanted to give you an under, a kind of a, a flavor of what this looks like. So right off the start, right on the, right out of the start, no context, no everything. He says, what should we do? Who are we? Why should we be? What are beings? Why does being happen? Philosophizing proceeds out of these questions upward into unity. Interesting. He starts right off the bat with these perennial questions, which you can infer that are from a place of fragmentation and the trajectory of philosophizing proceeds out of these questions upward into unity. What we extol as blessing depends on what afflicts us in, as, as a plight. What we extol as blessing, as blessing depends on what we afflicts us as plight. And on whether plight truly urges us on, i.e. urges us away from, starting at the situation and talking it over. Greatest plight that we must finally turn our backs on ourselves and on our quote-unquote situation and actually seek ourselves. I like this uh, to bring it to relevance of our time. This quote, a quote situation where he says here reminds me of, you know, in a very superficial way, but a very, in a very current way, the, 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 car, the current thing, right? The hyper focus of the globe through electronic media on the current thing, like it's uh, the only thing that's happening in the world. Whether it's, you know, the coronavirus, the reaction, you know, the, um, the uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict, it comes and it's the most important thing in the world and it, in 10 days it, it disappears. So I'm going to read that again. He says, greatest plight that we must finally turn our backs on ourselves and on our quote unquote situation and actually seek ourselves. Away from detours, which merely lead back to the same beaten paths, sheer evasions, remote and desolutory before the ineluctable. The human being should come to himself. Why? Because a human being, quote unquote, is a self. Yet is in such a way as to lose or indeed never win himself and to sit somewhere otherwise captivated and transported. We still scarcely see all this great being and potential for being as we gaze at wretched Im uh, imitations and dried up and incomprehensible exemplars proffered quote-unquote types but how does a human being come to his self 
Through what are his self and its selfness determined? Is that not already subordinated to a first choice? Insofar as the human being does not choose and instead creates a substitute for choosing, he sees himself, one, through reflection in the usual sense, through dialogue with the thou, through meditation on the situation, and through some idolatry. So these are the four ways that the human being substitutes for choosing, and he sees himself. So one, through reflection on the usual sense, like common sense, common knowledge, conventional wisdom. Two, through dialogue with the thou. I can, you can think of that as the superego or the big other. Three, through the meditation on the situation, again, the current thing, or through some idolatry. And this through some idolatry takes many forms. I think the key form is through the will to power, the idol of power. But this through idolatry can be anything, could be status, can be uh, wealth, um, physical appearance, importance. Um, but of course, pride is the, the central figure that leads to all idolatries, right? Moving on, supposing, however, that the human being had chosen and that the choice actually struck back into his self and burst it open i.e. supposing that the human being had chosen this dislocatability of the being of beings and by this choice was placed back into Dasein. And uh, footnote for Dasein here, I'm going to read it for you guys. Heidegger's term more uh, in the most literal sense is thereness. For the beings we ourselves are, thematized specifically as places, da, where occurs an understanding of what it means to be, sein. When hyphenated Dasein, this thematization is emphasized. Back to the text. So, i.e., supposing the human being had chosen the dislocatability of the being of beings and by this choice was placed back into Dasein, must he then not proceed far into the stillness of the happening of being, a happening which possesses its own time and its own silence? Must he not have long been silent in order to find again the power and might of language? and to be born by them. Must not all frameworks and specialties be shattered here and all worn down paths be devastated? Must not a courage, one which reaches very far back, attune the disposition here? Someone, it's an interesting uh, analogy here. Someone who sticks fast to the foot of the mountain, how will he ever see the mountain? Only more and more rocks but how to come upon the mountain? Only through a leap from another mountain, but how to come upon that one? Already to have been there, to be someone placed on the mountain and ordered to be there. Who is already so, and is still because no other can drive him away. Beginning and re-beginning of philosophy. That's the first section. It's broken down into uh, numbered sections as you can see here, we'll do one more here. We stand before nothingness, to be sure, but in such a way that we do not put nothingness and this standing into effect, do not know how to put them into effect. Cowardness, cowardice and blindness before the opening of the being that bears us into beings. Indeed, not before nothingness, instead before each and every thing, but as non-beings. Must the great lone path be ventured silently into Dasein, where beings become more fully beings, untroubled by all situations? Has it not long been folly and confusion and groundlessness to run after the quote-unquote situation? Situation, at the beach and in the sand, small muscles are splashed about. Into them, we wriggle and see only wrigglers, but never the waves and the upsurge of beings. So this is a definition he sort of puts here for the quote unquote situation we find ourselves in. He says, at the beach and in the sand, small muscles are splashed about. Into them we wriggle. So we are the small uh, muscles, right? Into them we wriggle and see only wrigglers. You see every other, everybody's flashing about, slashing about. But never the waves and the upsurge of beings. 
never the waves and the upsurge of being. So we are, we are not aware of the energetic waves and the upsurges that manifest themselves in here in modernity through you know, the, technolo the technology that recedes in the background as soon as it takes hold of our consciousness. That was a note for me. Back to the text here. Nothingness, which is higher and deeper than non-beings, too great and worthy for any individual or altogether to stand before it. Non-beings, which are less than nothingness, because expelled from the being that negates all beings. Less, because undecided, neither amid beings, since these latter are more fully, nor amid nothingness. A disregarding the situation is to be set in motion, but out of the positive aspect of the ineluctable, the disregarding of the situation and the justification for doing so. We first are our situation when we no longer ask after it. Back into the unconscious, i.e., not into complexes, but into the truly happening and necessary, quote-unquote, spirit. The devilish, or rather deified, farming of the situation. The semblance of seriousness. Mankind no longer knows what to do with himself. Mankind no longer knows what to do with itself and consequently conjectures, quote-unquote, everything in the end. Aren't we living in a world where everything is happening all the time, all at once? Mankind believes it must do something with itself and does not understand that Dasein has already done something with it, the beginning of philosophy, from which mankind fled long ago. This the fact that in Dasein beings have being, i.e. become more fully beings and more fully nullified, is the mission of humanity in this happening. Being in time, a very imperfect attempt to enter into the temporality of Dasein in order to ask the question of being for the first time since Parmenides. Objection to the book. I have even today, Heidegger says, still not enough enemies. It has not brought me a great enemy. So with all of these critiques, he says, there's no great enemy, no great critique that he can, uh, that can shake his thinking. Thoughtlessness toward the quote unquote tradition and disdain of the contemporary belong to the keen hearing and diff diffidence before the past. I will leave it there for now. And um, let me know if you guys are interested. We'll get a little bit deeper and I will see you guys next time. God bless.